Our next speaker uh, needs no introduction in Queensland, but we have international visitors here, uh, and you're about to meet our 36th Premier for the state, who served us for nine years, from 1998 to 2007. And I remember that time very well, because I was very excited by his passion for science and technology. He brought in uh, what's known here as the Smart State Initiative, and it even changed our number plates from being the Sunshine State, which it is, uh, to the smart state, and I loved that. He was um, so keen to make sure that Queenslanders understood that we are actually very smart here, and we do do world-class research, and we can have a world-class industry. So um, years later, there's been a lot of success. Uh, many things have happened in Queensland in biotechnology as a result. He's probably one of the most articulate premiers we've ever had as well. Uh, so I, I'm very pleased to welcome to the stage, and would you please make very welcome, Peter Beattie. Well, Richard asked me if I would talk about why government needs to keep up with rapid developments in the spatial industry to effectively shape a sustainable future, which is a very worthy topic, and I'll sort of breeze over it at some point. Let me talk about a number of things that came out of my post-discussions with people after uh, my presentation at lunchtime. And there are three things that I, I need to deal with. Firstly, one of the challenges that government has, and you're from industry, so you understand industry. I'm from government, or was, so I understand government. One of the real challenges that government has when it makes decisions, and this is where you have a vital role, is getting objective data. Now, those of you who are from Queensland and have a long memory will remember a battle I had over Cubby Station. Does anyone remember Cubby Station? A few of you do. In my view, it was a piece of vandalism that was built many years ago on the Queensland border, which basically stole all the water out of the river systems, took it out of the Murray-Darling, and basically did huge damage to the Murray-Darling river system. So Queensland's at the top of the Murray-Darling. For those of you from overseas, it's our big internal river system. This huge property uh, was built which took all the water out, which basically affected the quality and the health of the, of the river system. I tried to get the federal government and my colleagues in New South Wales to buy Cubby Station back off the owners, and they were almost bankrupt at the time, to, re to restore the river system to the health that it needed and should have had. Now, those of you who again remember this will recall, I went to a very public meeting in Durrambandi with a whole lot of really angry locals who were terrified about what would happen to their jobs. They were largely put up by the people who owned Cubby Station, I might say. In the end, I lost that battle. But how could government have made a better decision using your data? Now, we employed some scientists to actually look at the information and talk about it publicly, but it was too late in the debate. What we need, and this is where I urge you as an industry to go, when you get the data from government or data from whatever source, you need to get a level of objectivity to the data and the science so that when you talk about the health of the river system, it becomes impossible for those who have a vested and self-interest to maintain, in this case, a blockage on the river system because the data indicates clearly that the health of the river system is at risk if it remains. Or, more to the point, you can't build a particular project on this river system because it will affect the health of the river. So let me just come to a really important point. I hope, I hope you see it as an important point. Not only should your industry be looking at the things we talked about at lunch, that is involving the community, being a, a, a community-based decision-making process, what I think you need to look at your industry is a piece of government's armour in the sense of informing the community in an objective way. And science and data is the only way that you can get that level of objectivity. Because where else do you go? The rest of it becomes, po becomes political. You have, as I said, the vested interests, you have the people who, who want to see something done because they're going to benefit from it without looking at the common good. So that's why data and science is absolutely pivotal to government. And again, I would urge you in any engagement you have with government, you actually talk to them about you being, that is, the data you have as being an asset to the government decision-making, not some liability. And I would hope that one of the things that 
comes out of this conference is that we can ac actually say to government that an, uh, an electorate or, or a community that's enriched by uh, science and data is part of the solution, not the problem. It's part of the solution to good government make, good, good decision making. So that's the first point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make is someone said to me, well, all right, how do we really build credibility to be taken seriously? I think my friend from Canada, Perry, you asked me this in a sense, and I didn't quite give you the complete answer. And since I promised I would give you the complete answer, let me finish it now. I know when our Canadian friends are going home and saying we're not holding up our end of the Commonwealth. The, the, the <laughs> one of the ways that you can strengthen the importance of, of this industry is to do what the biotech industry has done, and that is have centres of excellence. And if you look at the American model, what did they do? I remember what happened in Texas. I went there when I was opposition leader, when we were looking at how you developed innovative strategies. What did you do? Well, the Texans at one point, I think it was the late 70s, had difficulty, it ran out of oil. Oil wasn't as, as uh, prevalent as it was, so they went to innovation. They, had, they brought in a system of white knights, they had centres of innovation, they did it in universities, and out of that grew this enormous industry in Texas. So to finish, Perry, the answer to your question, I think what needs to be done both here and in other parts of the world are centres of excellence based around data. Now what that means in a sense is getting companies to co-locate in one place. For those of you who have any, spent any time in Silicon Valley know that what they did many years ago, particularly in the university sector, was to get people out of the silos. We had engineers mixing with, with uh, cardiologists and then you have engineers building things for the heart. So you had people thinking outside their sphere of ex expertise. And as a result, you got a more broadly based solution to problems. And that's the, that's the strength of the American model, if you like. They actually do think outside the silos. And that's when you bring people together, you get that cross fertilization. So I would argue that one of the things that this industry should do is argue to government, you need centers of excellence. You may need one, you may need two, you know, we have stupid state arguments around this country, but not as much as you do in the US, I hasten to add, but you still do. So maybe you need a couple of them. But if you have a hub, a centre of excellence where you've got smart people sparking off one another, then out of there will come such a powerful force that government will not be able to ignore it. The third thing is the power of commercialisation. That's the other powerful wing of how you enhance your argument with government and the community. Now, power of commercialisation sounds like a trite uh, phrase, but it's not. Because the more businesses that develop, the bigger the industry. I gave you some examples at lunch of Queensland companies that have actually gone to the world, that 100 com those 100 companies that I set out. They're only a small part, the tip of the iceberg. But the importance of commercialisation and creating businesses is really important. Because one of the examples I want to give you is this. Australia is really good at research, but very bad at commercialising it. And that is one of the fundamental weaknesses of our economy. It's one of the strengths of the American economy. It's one of the areas that the Chinese are spending a small fortune on. And biotech, I know, for example, in their current five-year plan, they're spending 308 billion US dollars in developing their biotechnology industry. At a time, I must say, when there have been certain contractions in the US, which has been, and still is, the dominant partner in the world on this. So they understand the importance of commercialising it. We have to fill that gap. And I'll give you an example, and just bear with me on this. Every year, INSEED, which is a French business school, it releases a global innovation index, and the latest was in 2014. It comes out around about September, August, so the 2015 one is about to come out fairly shortly. And Australia ranks 17th out of 143 countries on the index. They look at 143 countries, we come in at 17. Now, in a, in a nutshell, this, this means that we have fairly good science and innovation. We're fairly good at it. I mean, you might think 17 is not that good, but it is. It's actually 17 out of 143 is pretty good. However, when it comes to the Global Efficiency Index, which is part of the same index, this is, how, this is, this is based on how we commercialise that scientific innovation. Australia ranks 81st. Just think about that. We come in at 81 and we're behind New Zealand, Uganda, and Uruguay. Now, 
The bottom line of it is, as I said before, great science, we do not commercialise it enough. That means we do not take it to small businesses that are rolled out. Now, yes, you will always find good examples of what we've done, but on a global scheme, scheme compared to the rest of the world, we do not do it as well as we should. Now, this has really been a direct result of a failure of government policy of both sides of politics. Both sides of politics. And that's why, again, when you engage government, it has to have a component of actually commercialising the data opportunities and highlighting the companies, which I tried to do at lunchtime, of what that means. Yes, we've got 100 companies here. How many jobs does that create? What does that mean in terms of export income? These are the sort of things that actually get notice of government. Now, yes, I can talk about why government should take notice, and I covered that at lunchtime. That is because without appropriate planning, we're not going to get it right. Government cannot deal with the growth challenges of the 21st century without the focus of your industry. And that's obvious. I can say that in 15 different ways, but let's just take that as a given. I'm now saying that this industry's got a role of actually educating government. That's what you have to do, in my view, if you're going to get the sort of attention that government should be giving you so that they can actually pick up the information to help themselves. You've got to get government to understand they need you to help them. And I can't be more specific than that. One of the, uh, I guess, most enlightening things that happened when Heather and I were within the US, we spent a few weeks in Detroit and Pittsburgh. And I'll give you my impressions. Some of our American friends may not share this, but let me give you my impressions. As a kid growing up, what did you think about with, when you, whenever anyone mentioned Detroit? What do you think about Detroit? Cars. Henry Ford. The assembly line. One of the great innovators. It wasn't just cars and assembly lines. He did uh, tractors. He did farm equipment. He even had a, a wing of aviation. And not only that, he built all those protective vehicles for the president. He had the bulletproof glass and, and the, the bomb proof. Henry Ford did it. Ford Company did it. So this was the home of innovation. We were there for two weeks. It's a bit of a sad story, really. There are 80,000 buildings that are actually falling into disrepair. Repair. Unemployment levels, something like 20%. Over a million people have left the heart of Detroit over the last 50 years. It was almost in decay. When we were there, there were three people, because it was winter, you know how those, they have those warming vents in the US. They were lying on cardboard to actually try and warm themselves right in front of the headquarters of GM, right in front of the world headquarters of GM, who that day were bragging that they might be, might be able to pay back the US government for the bailout they got that stopped them from hitting the wall. So here was the home of innovation that had lost its mojo, if you like, that had lost its focus on innovation, that had lost its focus on value-adding, it was a basket case. Now, what started, of course, with competition from Japan, they lost the global competition war, they didn't respond to it. They didn't use their brain, they didn't use the data, they didn't have a look at what was happening. But secondly, when the motor vehicle parts started to be poached by companies elsewhere in the United States and from overseas, they didn't respond to that either. So my point is, and I'm about to go to the next stage in this, but my point here is, in a global world, you cannot be left behind. You have to respond to the challenges, and the way to do that is to have appropriate planning, and the people in this room are the ones who can provide the appropriate planning. That's why I stress again, you have an obligation to engage with government. Let me give you the second part of the story. Four and a half hours drive from Detroit is Pittsburgh. So when you think about Pittsburgh, what do you think about? Steel. That's right, steel. Well, you know, steel hasn't been doing terribly well in the US either, for all sorts of reasons. But Pittsburgh and Detroit are like chalk and cheese. Because what Pittsburgh did, they did what the Texans did. They went out and did medical research. They did culture. They developed new industries. Going from Detroit, which was depressing and in decay, to Pittsburgh was like going from darkness into light. They both had enormous challenges. Detroit had challenges to the vehicle industry and their parts for the vehicles, and they didn't respond. They basically collapsed, and now it's bankrupt. It's the biggest bankruptcy in the history of the United States, one of the biggest bankruptcies in the world, Detroit. 
absolutely didn't respond. Yet over here, Pittsburgh did respond. And you've got this energy in Pittsburgh. You've got companies there. You've got, you can see the innovation. So my point about all this is very simple. If you go back to my point about NSEED at the beginning, we've got great science, but we don't have the full answer either. That's why whatever you do as an industry, you have to have a focus on commercialisation. Because out of that will grow jobs, out of that will grow your political influence, and out of that will grow a position where you cannot be ignored. And that's absolutely essential. Oh, I have to say, I was uh, in, impressed with Anna Puma's presentation. And uh, I follow India very carefully. I went there many years ago. In fact, I opened Queensland's first trade office in Bangalore in the state of Connecticut. And Morty's promised a number of things, your Prime Minister. He's promised power to everybody, cooking gas, vehicles. He's even got people opening bank accounts. He is going to change India. You notice that President Obama's been there twice in recent times, and he's taken a whole lot of American companies there because he wants India to be the balance to China, I'm afraid. I hate to tell you the dynamic political reality of this. He's not there because he loves you. He's there because Americans need you, and he wants to have a balance to China. From our point of view, we're in love with both China and India. We don't discriminate. <laughs> we're like that. Australians, we just love everybody. We want everyone to love us, OK? My point is this. He can't deliver, and a lot of coal will come from Queensland for that generation. He cannot deliver the energy he's promising without coal. And we all know what that means for global warming. We all know not enough money has been going into clean coal technology or alternatives. Therefore, this industry, again, has a role to play, not just here, but globally. We can share with India. We can share the research opportunities and the commercialisation of the companies that can provide you the solutions to the problems, because the Prime Minister cannot do this on his own. You can imagine, as you've identified in your excellent address, what your objective is now is fine. It's very, it's very good to say that to the population of India, but when it happens, there are problems that come with it. You have the advantage of solving those problems before they arise. It's like with phones. You avoided having landlines, you just went straight to mobile. You saved yourself a fortune with all those underground lines. And that's what India wants to do, of course. Go to the next level of development, but without the, the difficulties. And the final message I want to leave to, with you is two things. One, the Reserve Bank says very clearly, our Australian Reserve Bank says, that improvements in living standards could be at risk unless there's a dramatic increase in productivity as Australia's mining industry investment uh, boom subsides. That's true. Do you know the solution to that? We've got a wage structure here that's not going to change overnight, and, and frankly, from a workforce point of view, why would it? But the way to increase productivity is by using data, by using research, by using innovation. That's how you become competitive. If you have any doubts about it, look at the Germans. Germans, six weeks annual leave, you know, they're an expensive country, yet they've got the smart end of innovation. They sell their technology to, to uh, China. They sell it around the world. It's the big economy in Europe because they're innovators and they're very smart about it. The final thing I want to say about Germany is this. They're also going to the next stage about renewables. They've actually bitten the bullet, bullet about renewables. And in fact, uh, if you have a look at the, the, uh, the cost of energy. In, in, by 2025, Germany aims to produce 40 to 45 per cent of its electricity from renewable sources. And this will rise to 50 per cent by 2050. Now, there's a downside, of course, with that. Electricity prices have gone up. And uh, electricity costs for companies have risen by 60 per cent in the last five years. Prices are now double those in the US, in Germany. Now, why does Germany remain competitive? Because of the innovations I said before. And just remember this, because some you're a lot younger than me, most of you, in fact, all of you. Just remember this, if Germany gets the renewables right, what are they going to do? They'll sell it to the world. That's why innovation is so important. And that's why the Germans, I mean, Merkel's got a very high-risk strategy, but if it produces results, then they will continue to be one of the wealthiest nations on earth. Innovation, what you do, is wealth, it's jobs, what I said before. I wish you well. I appreciate the invitation, Richard, you extended for me to be here both at lunch and now. I just finished where I started at the lunchtime thing. Please, don't just look at your navels as an industry. 
Do not say how wonderful you are, that you've got the best innovations in the world, unless you can convince government that you're an important industry that sets up centres of excellence for you to hub together, to grow off one another, unless you can actually get government to understand that, and unless you can commercialise these and show the world, you will not reach your full potential. And if you don't, then Australia and those developing countries are going to be the worse off for it. Thank you.